right. Welcome to another episode of The Catholic Couple, having fun with faith, family, and friends. I'm your co-host, Bobby Fredrickson. With me, as always, my beautiful wife. Katie Fredrickson. I'm the convert Catholic. And, and I'm the, the cradle Catholic. And here we are in a special episode with Steve Simone, a stand-up comedian and a Yay. Catholic. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, right before we got on, he, he shared a prayer with us. We thought it would be excellent if he could share with everybody. So yeah, tell on. us, the, yeah, recap the, the prayer, where it came from, and we'll pray it together. Okay. Well, first, I want to thank you both for this opportunity, and I'm humbled. And um, the only thing I really do take seriously is my faith. (laughs) (laughs) So um, whenever an opportunity like this arises, which isn't often for a stand-up comedian, I take it seriously, and and I'm I'm a a little nervous. So whenever I don't know what to do, my only solution is more Jesus. (laughs) <laughs> right, yeah. like, and which is off. I usually don't ever really know what to do, so the answer is always. You're more praying Jesus. all the time, <laughs> absolutely. So there's this great priest that I love. Um, his name's Father Jim Blunt, and he's so joyful. He's like this powerhouse of holy joy, but he's also an exorcist. So, so cool. Um, whenever I've seen him in retreat or I watch him on YouTube, to be honest with you, he often shares his prayer and it's called the unity prayer, which is, uh, it does have a bishop's imprimatur to draw us. Um, so it's an approved prayer to draw us closer to Jesus. And I'd like to share it with you and your audience if I could. That'd be great. Please. All right. And name the father, son, Holy spirit. and that. My adorable Jesus. May our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the eternal Father. Amen. Amen. And the cool thing about that, it's supposed to blind Satan. That's so awesome. He, well, he I feel on the map to him, right? Now. Yeah, I feel instantly calm when we when we prayed it both yeah, times. That was, so maybe that's it. It's that spiritual attack on pause if there's any any around that, which usually does happen anytime we do a podcast. Yeah, it's funny. Absolutely. And do you get like technical issues? Like, Always. oh yeah. Whenever I talk about Jesus with my with my buddies over the phone, technology the phone demons. Yeah. Oh, yeah, wow. we're always we're always dealing with it. It's it's crazy. Well, my I laptop the totally, gremlins. The, my laptop totally. I had to get a whole new laptop. It's like it just, just shut down. Working. Yeah, it's just and it was only like two years old, and it's a Mac. It's like <laughs> that doesn't happen. So mm-hmm. it was, it's constant. So yeah, you guys are doing good work. That's mm-hmm. awesome. Well, all, all glory to God. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's been fun. It's it, it's awesome that social media gets a lot of you know, bad rap and it should. You know, there's good and bad of everything, but it's the positive parts is is that we can meet people we never would have thought to connect people, you know, on, you know, on Instagram. That's how we, like a little Catholic community, you know, right? Like people that you would have never met because we're so spread out that now we're able to be in touch and, and be in each other's lives in that way. So where are you located, Steve? Where are you at right now? Currently I live in Florida now. I left Los Angeles during the uh, pandemic Mm -hmm. and it was the best one of one of the best decisions I've ever made. It. Well, I didn't make it. God literally told me to move here. <laughs> so that's good. I listened. I was obedient, and that was it. It's great here. Are, are you close to like a comedy club you you normally work at, or is it is it? Yeah. Um. Well, I moved to the country, country part of Florida, like not the cool hipster part of Florida. <laughs> like I moved. I had a. I was doing a lot of charity work in L.A., and a dear friend of mine, my buddy John, grew up in this area. And we were like, okay, it's end times. Like during the pandemic in LA, <laughs> a zombie movie. We we're right. like, it's happening. It's happening. What do we do? Yeah. And he goes, he goes, you have to get to Polk County. And I'm like, what's Polk County? He was like, it's Noah's Ark with hand grenades. <laughs> all, all done. <laughs> That's so yeah. Go. What did stand up comedians do over the pandemic? Like, I mean, what is the primary way that you make your money? Right. Like going. Comedy clubs well, and what, what's your, yeah. How did you survive that? Well, the Lord took care of me, right? Like it's biblical first seek the kingdom mm-hmm. and we'll give you everything else. Mm-hmm. Like a, a long time ago, um, I just surrendered everything to him. Mm-hmm. 
And I was just like, because I was always worried about finances. Mm-hmm. You know, being in the arts, I'd be like, okay, I have this much money. And I was I was trying to do it. Mm-hmm. And that was fruitless. Yeah. And then, well, you know what? I have a father in heaven. He's going to take care of me. That's so awesome. And um, I was very fortunate that some of my comedy albums uh, were very popular. So um, they play them consistently on the uh, family-friendly state uh, radio stations. Uh, mm-hmm. Sirius uh, has a station, I believe they rebranded it, and they call it Pure of All Things. <laughs> and it's uh, clean comedy. There's not a lot of it out there. Mm-hmm. So with God's grace, I mean, I was able to survive off of royalties. I actually mm-hmm. bought my first home <laughs> during the pandemic. And when I was on the phone with like a mortgage broker, he's like going over my finances. He's like, what's this that comes in every month? I'm like, <laughs> oh, that's, that's my royalties. He goes, royalties for what? I go, uh, I'm a comedian. And they play my comedy on the radio and there's a long pause. And he went, huh, what a country. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say, tell me a joke. I mean, yeah. that's what I would have done. I'd be like, oh, okay, can you tell me a joke right now? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm barely an adult, dude. I don't know. <laughs> that's so, that's that's so awesome. cool. So how did you originally get into to, to comedy? I, I saw some of your bio. You grew up in the Philly area. Yeah. And then... Um, it's kind of like Chicago where we, we grew up on the oh, South side of Chicago. So mm-hmm. I know similar. I say Chicago's Philadelphia was self-esteem. Like <laughs> it's, it's similar culture, but you go to Chicago, people are proud. They're like, you got to do this. You got to do that. in Philly people are like, Oh, I can't wait to get out. <laughs> <laughs> it is culturally so similar to Philly. It's, it has that blue collar work ethic mm-hmm. yeah. that like, you know, you could be a neuroscientist, but your dad was swinging a hammer. So you go home and you cut your own grass. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> I love Chicago. And it's also a great food city. Yeah, it yeah. is. Chicago, whenever I have a chance to go, I love it. And they're both known for having a lot of like, well, tough people, mm-hmm. but also really funny people. Like mm-hmm. most of my comedic heroes have spent some time. In Chicago, or originally from Chicago. Well, Second like, City, right? Yeah, I Bill mean, Murray, a, mm-hmm. Chris Farley, yeah. um, Sebastian. Like, Chicago's got a lot of funny people. Yeah. 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 Where are you right. usually in Chicago? Is that Zany's is the, the big night club, done, the comedy club? Yeah. And I haven't been there in, in quite some time. But um, there's a kid who's not a kid. There's a young man who's a comedian and also an animator. So I'm in the process of putting together my new stand-up comedy special and just how God works, right? Like the animator's father is an Armenian Catholic priest. So we started to talk about the Lord. (laughs) And then he let me know that his brother is an Armenian Catholic priest in Chicago. And I was like, okay, dude, if I make any money off this special – I'm going to fly you from Canada. We're going to move to Chicago and we're going to have your brother give us the best food tour. Imagine. Right. Oh, that's <laughs> that's what, cool. quite the combination. Yeah. So just growing up as uh, would you have two brothers? You're one of three brothers. Yeah. I'm in the middle. Um, grew up in um, a glorious part, like generation X. It was totally a different world. The last generation to grow up without the internet. Mm-hmm. We spent uh, a lot of time outside. Like the neighborhood I grew up in was primarily a bunch of little boys at like maybe 30 little boys and three little girls that would just watch us from windows because they were forbidden to come out of that hall. <laughs> <laughs> we were crazy. It was yeah. like the little rascals. We would have BB gun fights and bottle rockets and building ramps. And somebody was always falling out of a tree. And if they were really hurt, we would just leave them there. We're like, run. <laughs> like, it was joyful, chaotic. Child, it was the best. Mm-hmm. And I think humor was the love language of my house. Yeah. Um, like we so blessed that my mom was to stay at home yeah. when we especially when we were really little. Mm-hmm. So there was family dinner every night, and that's where it was just, you know, three boys, and my dad was the best comedy audience until he got angry with us. Like he would <laughs> laugh. That's it. <laughs> like, like, you're keeping the laughs going. You're laughing a second ago. Yeah. So that's kind of where I learned how to do it. Um, and learned your boundaries at the same time, clearly. He said them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it was just an expression of love and joy and laughter. And like I said, there were a lot of little kids in our neighborhood. And some of the guys were like really good athletes. Or they were like the crazy kid that would go off high jumps. And I, I didn't, I have more of a sidekick 
genetic code. I'm not cut <laughs> my mm-hmm. But I realized if I made people laugh, I could make friends. Mm-hmm. And I was always invited. Mm-hmm. So I think that that's, it really grew out of that. I didn't think I could do it as a living until nothing else worked. But wow. as a kid, I was, yeah, it was always funny. People yeah, I was, funny. uh, I got good grades, but I always got my work done early. So I was the class clown. So I was the same way. I had three brothers in our neighborhood. That's how we grew up shooting BB guns at each other. Do you think yeah. you'd ever uh, succeed at stand up comedy? Though? I've had, I had that dream for a while. I'm more <laughs> of like, serious? yeah, really? I'm more of like, um, like, you're more I, like a zinger. Like I'm like a zinger. Yeah. Like, I, like I'm real quick. He's like good with, with his put, put downs. Uh, that, yeah. That's where I'm at. Quick that wins. was my younger brother. I used to call him the sniper. Yeah, like, that's me. My house, my older brother, hands down, funniest guy ever. But so then I would take what my older brother did and just add more energy to it mm-hmm. and maybe not be as respectful of boundaries and go in for the kill. Mm-hmm. My little brother was trying to compete with these two guys so he could just murder the room with just really like a well timed oh, really. oh, He got <laughs> yeah. work for the kill. Yeah. Nice. No, that's awesome. But Bobby, if comedy is something you really want to do, um, one of the things there's not, I don't really have many tangible life skills. That's how I know God's <laughs> real. Um, but I love helping people pursue this. Like there's a guy, my jujitsu coach's father, I started working with him less than a year ago. Like I found out he was a big comedy fan and there's levels to being a fan. And I went, okay, wait, he's more than a fan. He wants to do this. So I asked his son, I said, are you sure your dad doesn't want to be a comedian? He's like, I don't know. I know he loves it. I was like, ask him about that. And it was his lifelong dream. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, and I'm so proud of this guy because he's already at the point where he's emceeing at local comedy clubs. Like, I was able to close that learning curve for him. Okay, cool. So I was able to, you know, chop out three years uh, wow. trial and error go, no, dude, this is the way to do it. I and guess, yeah, I guess I don't know if I really want to get, I want to be, be the lead singer of a nineties cover band. Yeah, That's my number one dream. Exactly. Like nineties <laughs> as a wise man. Yeah. yeah right. <laughs> exactly. Not Nickelback, but Let's, some, some, yeah. some like uh the stone temple pilots, yeah, Pearl STP, Jam, right. SDP, mm-hmm. Everclear, that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. Yeah. But I definitely want to be a better storyteller and be funny at like what we do with the podcast and YouTube. And I'm, I do another show with my friend Khalil just to be a, I, I watch your, your stand up and it's, it's, you're a great storyteller and how to, to bring in, you know, relevant, you know, to be funny at the same time, but to still try to educate and inspire. Well, cause people learn from, you know, that's how we learn. We learn best from stories. And, yeah. and you capture people's attention with a story because they want to hear how it ends. Even if like, that's how I am. I still, even if I don't like a movie or a TV show, I still have to see the end because yeah. I want to see what happens. But the same thing with like, when you have captivated someone with a story, they got to hear the end, right? Like whether they like it not or me. not. I can pause and go to yeah, bed. She's like, what are you doing? doing? No way. No way. Like, that like, sucks. I'm like, I'm like whatever. Who, who did it? I'll, I'll see it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's, I, I guess... For you, uh, from watching your, your comedy, it's like, I mean, obviously you're going off of like real stories and obviously making, you know, embellishing them some, mm-hmm. obviously, um, I don't know, problem. A lot of it's probably true because I, I, I can yeah. relate. I can relate to a lot of those stories, especially the video game battles. I mean, we, yeah. I mean, by the time we got a, a Nintendo, like it was like, we're like the last kid into the neighborhood and everybody was I fighting over I never even had it. one. Yeah. And how many boys were there in your house? Uh, I'm one of four. I'm the oldest of four boys. Oh, yeah. Yes. That's always a challenge. There's only two controllers. Yeah. And it's, uh, well, two went on to be a cop and one, uh, he was, he was the bad, the bad boy. So he, we, it was just always a, you know, MMA fighter. My brother was, and it's like, it was, it, my dad's a, a crazy man. It was just like, it was like, and my mom's four eleven, and she's just like tough as nails. It was, it was, it was like, uh, <laughs> and all the neighborhood kids were in our house. So it was like, it was just crazy. It reminded me of your stories, you know, in your standup. I was just like laughing, just relating to, cause that's exactly, you know, how it was for me growing up. It's like eventually the, the two, two middle one would finally team up to, to take me on, you know, before yeah, you know, that's, that's yeah, how it works. I, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So how did you take these stories? What, do you have a formula? How do you, how do you cultivate a, a, a line, a, you know, your, your lineup, what is it called? Your, your bid or your, list. your set list. Yeah. Your set special. list. Like, how do you cult, like, how do you cultivate it? How do you write it? What's your, what's your, uh, what's your um, I think the best place to write is actually on stage. 
that's why stage time is so crucial. Mm-hmm. Um, like, because people are like, oh, do you practice in a mirror? No, that's not, it doesn't work. And stand up comedy is not a monologue, at least the way I approach it. It's truly a dialogue with the audience. Mm-hmm. And they, in, in a perfect environment, they're participating with just laughter and sometimes applause and joy and not heckling. <laughs> so the first thing you re- always say, I have to do, my comedy only works if I connect with an audience because it's not very punchline specific. Mm-hmm. It's more like, how do I take the joy that's in my heart and put it into their heart? Yeah. So that's why I do pray before I perform. And then I just saw a priest like a year ago, maybe he said that his secret was he always prayed to his guardian angel to talk to the audience's guardian angel uh-huh. be on board. That's so that's another little, that's another little thing on my cheat code. Yeah. Uh, and I sometimes just pray to be a source of God's love. Right. Because then if I can take all these individuals, I think in any performance, the secret ingredient is truly the Holy spirit. Right. Mm-hmm. Because you have a comedy club filled with individuals but at some point, in order for this to work, in order to have a partner to have a dialogue with, all those individuals have to become one mm-hmm. and they have to be on the same page. Yeah. So through trial and error at the comedy store in Los Angeles, I started to learn how to connect with audiences. I can't explain how that happens. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I just say when, when, when God shows up, it's a grace and when it works, it works and when it doesn't. It's just another lesson in humility, right? Like, so once they're together, I would say that it took me about eight years to learn the language of stand-up comedy. Mm. And that's what I explained to young comedians. I'm like, it's not necessarily what you're saying, but it's how you express it. Mm -hmm. It's very much like learning a foreign language because Mm -hmm. you know the thought in your brain, but now how do you translate that to an audience? Yeah, And in comedy... If you over explain something, it's not funny. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. If you have to explain your joke, it's not funny, right? Not funny. But if you under explain it, they have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. And I remember reading an interview with uh, the late, great Sam Kennison, God Rest His Soul. And he talked about the power of connecting with an audience. And he said, when you're completely connected with an audience, you can just make a facial expression <laughs> and laugh. Yeah. And they laugh because they know they can read your mind. Mm-hmm. So they know what's causing that. Yeah. And an interview that really changed the trajectory of my comedy career was a great piece of advice I had read early on. And it was from Jim Carrey. And both Sam and Jim were comedy store guys. And that's where I was learning this craft mm-hmm. under the tutelage of the late, great Mitzi Shore, the godmother of comedy, God rest her soul. <laughs> And Jim Carrey, um, a real, he was one of my comedic heroes, you know, like in the nineties, like he was Chris Farley and Jim Carrey were the coolest people. Oh, in the world. I love Chris yeah. Farley. I know the best. Right. <laughs> um, and I, Jim started his comedy career essentially at the comedy store. Mm-hmm. Mitzi, the owner of the club actually signed his immigration papers from Canada mm-hmm. as an 18 year old kid. So he could get a green card. <laughs> But what isn't really common knowledge is as a very young man, he had an extremely successful career as an impressionist. Mm-hmm. He even had a sitcom like in the early 80s called The Duck Factory. I remember because I watched it. I was, I've always been a comedy nerd. Mm-hmm. And I talked to an old door guy from the comedy store that was there during those years. And he said, Jim bombed for like eight years. What happened was he had this very successful career. And he was making like a quarter of a million dollars a year in Vegas as an impressionist in like $1982. Like it's a lot of money. Yeah. But the artist, he wasn't fulfilled. So he was influenced by Sam Kinison mm-hmm. and then was like, oh, that's what I want to do with my comedy. I want to be able to tell the truth. Mm. For eight years, he would just go out and bomb. And wow. Sometimes walk the room. And then he said it all clicked one night that he had to speak to that audience the same way he would talk to his family and friends. He had Mm -hmm. to turn the comedy club into his living room and Mm -hmm. just be himself. Yeah. Wow. So I was, okay, let me, let me try that. And it was a lot of trial and error, Mm -hmm. but I got great advice from this comedian. His name's Eddie Griffin. Oh yeah. And he, he got this advice from Richard Pryor. 
So he said, Steve, this is coming from the mountaintop of comedy. Yeah, really. And he said, Richard Pryor saw Eddie as a young comedian and told him, he was like, you know what, Eddie, you're funny, you're good, but you're not going to be great until you lose your comic ears. And Eddie was like, what do you mean? He goes, your comic ears. He goes, you're saying something and then listening for the laugh. Mm. You're saying it because you want them to laugh. Mm-hmm. So you can't do that. You say it because you mean it. Mm. And be authentic. That's it. So you mentioned so many different comedians in different areas and they all were, um, and where you were was, oh, it's all secular uh, mm-hmm. and they were not clean comics. So, mm-hmm. and they struggled. Do you find it more of a struggle as a clean comic? I mean, do you feel like that's another check against you or what are I, your thoughts on not, that? That's not my, I don't, I can't even worry. Like I, I just feel called to do what God wants me to do where he places me. Mm-hmm. And whenever I get to do a podcast like this, I do like to make the distinction that I think I first read, I think it was Chesterton that said something along these lines. I think it was G.K. Chesterton that said, we don't need more Catholic writers. We need more writers who are Catholic. Yeah. Oh, wow. Like, yeah. That's the new influence of culture. So my job is to just speak my truth mm-hmm. wherever I may be. So I, I would, I like, because, you know, sometimes people are like, of course, whenever a church says they want to, I, I always say yes. <laughs> but I'm not a Catholic comedian. Like I'm right. not going to be. You're a just kid. a comedian who's Catholic. Right. So I'm out there in the world. Wow. So you're and not telling Jesus jokes. You're just, you're just being authentically you. Yeah. And I am at the point now where I'm share because I think just in the times in which we're living, mm. uh, there's a palpable uneasiness and sadness people carry with them. Yes. Yeah. And I feel obligated to give a reason for my hope and to, to give a reason for my joy. And there is, whenever I mention Jesus, and I, I haven't, had, the Lord's been telling me to be bolder and just trust. Mm-hmm. So, and it takes so many years to actually craft a, a piece of stand up comedy that's worthy to be filmed. But I'm experimenting more with my faith. Like, if the, if I, I don't plan what I'm going to say or do unless it's like, a, like a, I'm going to record an album or, a, or an hour special. Mm hmm. So I'll just go out and sometimes I'll talk about church and I'll talk about why it's awesome. And sometimes there are people that love it. And then there are other times people are like, there's a, An a, a reaction that uh, it's, it's you can like see their physical, like discomfort or their, mm-hmm. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Actually a deacon from uh, one of the local churches. He's great. Deacon Jason. And he came with his wife to a show and he was like, afterwards he was like, you're on the front lines. <laughs> well, that was incredible. He was like, I'm going to be praying for you. He was like, you have a very special ministry. Don't stop what you're doing. Cause like, I would call people out like, mm-hmm. Hey man, how much worse does it have to get before we give Jesus a chance? You know, like, <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, the COVID lockdowns, that was God's way of saying, go to your room and think about what you've done. I go, he gave us a time out and we're worse now. Like, let's <laughs> try. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And that is just authentically you. That is what you think. And that is bringing your belief system into it. But it's, but it's still at the same time as pointing out the obvious and the truth. Yeah. And it's funny. Right? Yeah. And it's natural. It's not being forced, you know? Correct. And I think there's a time and a place for everything. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I think we're all called to evangelize, right? Right. But there are, I think the best way for me personally to evangelize is just to love, is just to wash feet and listen, mm-hmm. you know? Um, you know, the quote attributed to St. Francis, I'm not sure if he really said it, but he said, always preach the gospel and use words when necessary. Mm -hmm. That's the lane I'm in. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to love people. And if I really want them to know Jesus, Mm -hmm. the best way for them to encounter him is with my love. Right. Right. And sometimes I think if you use the words too soon, it's going to push people away. It's going to have an opposite effect. Totally. No, I I think you have the the right frame because you know how did they convert the church early on it wasn't 
arguments. They didn't even have the Bible yet. It was by their joys. Like, how are they singing going to the to the lion's den? Mm-hmm. You know, the the joy of the gospel is the net which we catch souls, Mother Teresa mm-hmm. says. It's like, dude, that's what's lacking okay. in a lot of these churches. Yes. You know? And our church is a little bit, they play more contemporary music, but the people are so happy. And that's mm-hmm. why our church is on fire. It, you know, it doesn't, you know, the traditional people can kind of like sneer about it, but like, well, then tell your face, you know, be happier about <laughs> yeah. it. Oh, you know, need, if you love bro, Jesus, then this, tell your face. Google Father Jim Blunt. That is his, that is his, he's an apostle of holy joy. He's That's amazing. Awesome. Like he's, yeah, he's Irish and Italian and on fire for the <sighs> Lord and funny. Yeah. Mama mia. Like I'm Aww. stealing his phrases. He's great. That's and awesome. Just, that, that's what he says. He was like, you're going to convert. No more sour face saints. I think it was uh, Teresa of Avila that had said that. Yeah. And it was like, come on. He was like, it's your joy that's going to draw mm-hmm. people in. Yeah. Like and that, I definitely that. think that's a grace the Lord's given me. Yeah. Like people will be like, how are you so positive? Where's this joy? And I'm like, oh, I'm not. I'm miserable. I go, that's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and when I'm a vessel, I'm joyful. When I'm yeah. not, I'm unfortunately just me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's, it's like you said, it's the, the joy will open up the, the opportunity. And then it, one-on-one is how you convert people. You have to, but that the joy disarms them. And then, yeah, you don't start in like, let me tell you about the Lord, our savior. It's like, I, no. I would even you, say it's, you don't convert anybody. Oh, yeah, God too. does and he uses you. And if you were a witness with, by your life and your actions and how you treat others, like you said, yeah. Steve, then yeah. he just works through you. He does the converting. It's not us. Yeah. And it is through open. our, yeah. You have to be open. To and you have to be to able to surrender and have the, the bravery to allow him to yeah. just use you in that capacity, which is hard. That's easier said than done, you know? Yeah. I think people already know it when they encounter us. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Like, that's why the words aren't... Like, I remember one of my day jobs years ago. So I worked at Gold's Gym in Venice. Oh, yeah. just, that's, oh that's cool. The mecca, that's the mecca of... I was going to uh, say, Bob, are you geeked out? I was to meet Hulk Hogan randomly, and I got to meet him, and it was awesome. I got to meet so <laughs> many cool people. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. It was so cool. But it was, I'm, I'm generally a very shy person. Um, I keep to myself, I'm definitely introverted. But when I'm on stage, I feel like I have the green light to let that side out. Yeah. And then my job behind the counter at Gold's Gym, like checking people in, have a great workout, high five, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, and it was a great way to be joyful and not like uh, overbearing or no, I'm always afraid I'm going to annoy somebody or something. <laughs> No, I would be behind the counter, just filled with joy. Just like, I can't believe this is my life. The Pacific Ocean's there. I'm going to the comedy club yeah, tonight. Right. It didn't matter before and I had multiple jobs. And there was a woman that used to come into the gym who was so wealthy. I'm not exaggerating. Because um, she pointed this out one day. She was like, Steve, can I ask you a question? I was like, go for it. Let's. She was <laughs> like, why are you so joyful? I was like, why? I wasn't even aware of it. Mm-hmm. She was like, always smiling. And she was like, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but she was like, you shouldn't be this happy. I know how much money you make. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and then she said, I want to show you something. She was like, and she walked me to the door and she was like, do you see that Bentley? She was like, do you realize I have seven of those and I match my workout outfits to my Bentleys? Wow. She was like, I don't have that joy. And I felt it and I looked at her and I said, do you really want to know? And she looked at me and she went, is it God? (laughs) And I went, yeah. And she went, I thought so. Mm. It's an awesome witness. Yeah. So how did, how did, how did this, your faith get instilled? Is this something your family, you guys were. Yeah. Did you grow up with, with, did you grow up Catholic? Uh, Yeah. Grew up at Cradle Catholic, okay, um, and then I went to school. And then I went to I went to I lasted about three months in Catholic first grade, and <laughs> there was an, a nun. I pray for her, but more than likely should not have been teaching first grade. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to be a chair. whenever I talk about re- the religious. I want to be as respectful and as charitable as possible. Mm-hmm. But like she was giving us nightmares, literally, and mm-hmm. telling us we're all going to go to hell and things like that. And first graders. Wow. So I remember that was a very difficult, because my parents were like from Catholic school, from kindergarten through college, both mm-hmm. of them. And 
it was a difficult decision, but all of the kids by Christmas were half the class was gone. So I went to public school, uh, but my parents were, you know, faithful Catholics and it was just, you know, Italian and Irish. This is, Mm -hmm. we are. Mm -hmm. Um, but then when I went to college, I, 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 it was important to me because my faith was so important to me to choose a Catholic college. And I saw some things, uh, among those priests that were a cause for concern. I'll just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the turmoil the church is experiencing now, I experienced it 30 years earlier, Mm -hmm. where I remember thinking like, I know I want to be Catholic, but I'm like, is this church even Catholic? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I don't want to. It totally does. Not so much to this convert, but definitely to this cradle, for sure. Be as charitable as I can. So I was like, You're okay, doing a good I'll, job. <laughs> I, I will, I will just pray. Mm-hmm. Um, and try to do that. I was not living a very sacramental life mm-hmm. for about 10 years because of an experience in college. And then, um, my life was slowly becoming unlivable. Mm. I'd moved to LA, uh, as a complete leaf of faith. I really didn't know anybody there. I had like one contact, which was divine intervention. The Lord's hand was always with me, but like, you know, that old footprints prayer where there's only one set of footprints. I was, yeah. I was living single step footprints for about yeah. eight years in LA. Like <laughs> it, was, it was like, I thought I had, I knew suffering, but the Lord really, it was, he's planned so perfect, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I got to the point where I couldn't carry my cross anymore. Mm -hmm. And Jesus was like, are you ready? Mm. That's when I had like a personal encounter with Jesus. Wow. Where it wasn't religious. It was like, Hey man, I, it can't get any darker in my life. It was bad. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny. We're doing this on March 18th. Because it was a horrific St. Patty's Day that changed my life. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I drank for about 18 hours. Mm-hmm. And I woke up with the worst hangover imaginable. And the thought was, okay, Lord, I understand this hangover is a consequence of my decisions yesterday. I'm willing to accept this. But I need your help because when I die... I don't want to hang over from my life. Yeah. Ooh, I, I don't, yeah, want, that's really good. don't want to appear in front of your judgment and go, I ruined it. I messed up. Mm-hmm. I go, you're going to have to help me. Mm-hmm. And I started to go back to church and it changed. I never knew the grace in the sacraments. I remember the first Sunday mass I attended after that St. Patty's day. And I, the priest in the final blessing. And he was like, and peace be with you. I'm like, wait a sec, this is all about peace. That's the one thing missing in my life. I have no peace. Yeah. But why did they tell us this? <laughs> that this is the only, the only way to get through life. It's not about obeying rules and God doesn't want a greater good for you. Like in my brain, I thought there was some sort of mm, joy or go- some benefit. I thought there was some benefit to sin mm-hmm. and God was pr- going, nope, you can't have that. Mm-hmm. Like a Catholic home, I'm like, mom, you're saying I can't have peanut butter and jelly because they're too delicious. I can have a peanut butter sandwich and yeah. not a jelly sandwich. Like I thought it would, I thought the rules were preventing joy, mm-hmm. but I didn't realize that was God's plan to protect us. Mm-hmm. And, and the fruit of that is peace. Yes. So I slowly, I, I made it a habit to attend Sunday mass and I slowly started to sort of I don't know. I, I'm going to, I'm going to mispronounce the word, but I started to learn more about my faith. All of this stuff that really wasn't being taught in the eighties and nineties in the Catholic yep, church. We were gypped for sure. <laughs> right. And, and, and then um, like, man, was I so fearful of confession. Mm. I was so afraid. Cause I always thought it was like, I viewed God as almost like a gangster and I owed him money. And I'm like, I don't have to pay. <laughs> and I, it started to slowly become just an encounter with love mm-hmm. and mercy. And the more I started to lead a sacramental life and say my rosary, 
God slowly has been adding more and more and more, mm-hmm. revealing more of the beauty of our faith. Um, and then that at, at a certain point had to influence what I do on stage and what I write. And what, there was this disconnect and it was just mm-hmm. purely ignorance where I was like, no, I could talk about whatever I want on mm-hmm. stage and go to church on Sundays. Mm-hmm. But um, the Lord, he, he, he knows I'm an idiot that I'm not like, and he, you'd like, I remember like one year, probably 10, 12 years ago, I didn't know what to give up for Lent. So I was like, I prayed on it. And it was like, how about profanity on stage? And I'm like, Oh, all right. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> that was my opening joke for about the first couple of weeks of Lent, right? Like, oh, guys, I gave up cursing on stage for Lent. I don't know how this is going to go. Right. And I, it, it actually worked better. And I was like, uh, Oh, Huh. And then I started to get involved in children's hospital with mm-hmm. children's hospital. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't like in an official capacity. There was truly a, a modern saint, God rest his soul named Raul Gonzalez, that um, he had a Saul to Paul conversion in his life. Mm-hmm. And every moment grateful to the Lord and just took care of those kids at children's hospital. Mm-hmm. And he came across some of my comedy and like, they would have like real celebrities going there. You know what I mean? I remember one of the things he told me, he was like, you know, to a four-year-old kid, Denzel Washington walks into the room. I'm like, Denzel Washington comes here? (laughs) He's like, these little kids, they don't know who he is, but he's like, you're silly. He was like, maybe you could bring some joy to these kids. Oh, wow. And, and and I went, "Uh uh-oh. I, after my first experience helping, I was like, I need this more than the kids do. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. and I went, oh, I literally have to clean up my act because the only thing I need is like some lady on the board or in charge of volunteers go, hey, did you see what he does on stage? Because I, w- I didn't have that celebrity. I didn't have the leverage to be like, I'm Jay-Z. I can yeah. say this. On- <laughs> 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 I couldn't do that. Right. I was just really lucky to be there. So I went, okay, I know I don't have to be, f- I don't have to curse to be funny. Um, this is something I really want to do. I always wanted to do the type of comedy families could enjoy together. Mm. Like, like I said, in my house, laughter was, was, was part of a, a tangible proof of the love in that home and God's presence. Yeah. But I remember watching like HBO comedy specials with my family. And when my dad would be like, okay, it's getting adult. And he would change the channel. I'm like, what did the comedian <laughs> say? What did he say? What, did he what say? does that mean, dad? <laughs> I always wanted to do the type of comedy that a dad or a mom would have to change the channel. I love that. Yeah. And, that was and always- that's still <laughs> funny. It doesn't have to be offensive. And I feel like now it's, it's just, like this, well, it's like this one up every time of how much more vulgar can we get? It's to me, it's not even funny anymore. Like we tried watching especially women, women comedians feel like the, the, they have to get extra vulgar. I don't, and I, to me, I, I, it tur- it's a turn off. Like I turn it off. Exactly. I think it's just indicative of the society. Yeah. I, we live like one of the jokes I used to do, maybe I'll bring it back. <laughs> I would talk, I was like, is everything on TV an instruction guide on how to sell your soul? Yeah. Like, like, like I really think so much of what Hollywood does is propaganda. And, and it's it, it's designed to make us miserable and drive us away from the truth. Mm-hmm. Like if going to church instills peace, I think our pop culture is designed to destroy peace. Amen. I agree with that. And we have such a crisis of despair and anxiety and depression. It's just like, just look around. It's, it's, it's sad. We need light and joy because that's what's going to rouse this deaf world. It's, it's either mm-hmm. the pain or the joy. It's like everyone's yeah. went through the pain. It's like, okay, that's not waking them up. Right. It's like, well, you know, we have to, to, you know, you can't hit him with the catechism. You hit him with the joy and the love. I think that there's a lot of trying to one up on shock value, you know? So how can we, we've pushed the envelope to this. So how can we, you know, we, we have to pique everyone's curiosity in some way. Right. And we've get them to stop, yeah. the get video, them to stop yeah. you know, so it's, it's, how can we, you know, arrive, like get, yeah, catch their attention. And it's got to be through something like, well, we, we pushed this envelope, so we got to push it a little bit more. So, but I think people are, are seeking the opposite now. I think that they've, that's to, so saturated that they're, yeah, they're, they're seeing through that. I, I they're looking so. for genuine. I hope so. Yeah. Cause it would be good for my career. I was going to say, so, so here you are. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> oh, here's something I do want to share. Cause every once in a while, the, 
and it doesn't happen often, but it happens often enough where I really look forward to it. I, I really think sometimes God speaks to me. And I had just mentioned money, right? And I remember, I don't know, it was like maybe two, two months ago, I was in the gym. And that's like one of the, I, I pray wherever I go, right? And I'm kind of like having a conversation with God, at least I'm talking. And I'm like, you know, if this special really launches me and I have, if I'm blessed financially, because I, I really do, I had such a positive experience at Children's Hospital. And I, like, I see the work that like St. Jude's Hospital does. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah help people like that Lord and build hospitals. And I was like, we need safe places for kids to be properly educated and this and all these plans I have for God. Right. (laughs) And he was like, you know what, Steve, I appreciate it. He was like, that's great that you want to do that for me. (laughs) But if you want to give me some, you know what I really want you to give me and it's not a hospital or a school. He was like, give me your brokenness. Hmm. He was like, that's going to, that's what you really want to make me happy. Give me all that stuff you're afraid to share. Give me your brokenness. Let me heal you. And I was like <laughs> crying on a at bench. The gym. So, at the gym. Whatever you want, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> like, the guy's like, uh, are you done with that machine, man? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's beautiful. Well, that, I teared up a little bit there. Well, that's, that's just, all. that's the courage of it. That's the, you know, being vulnerable. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about that this week because I just filmed a video on about the stations of the cross, I was just thinking about it, is that Jesus becomes vulnerable so that we can become vulnerable. Mm-hmm. If God can be vulnerable, why can't we? Mm-hmm. You know, especially like I'm a you know, tough guy or whatever. You're at the, you know, it's like, it's like no, no one, like, you know, all of our role models aren't vulnerable. But that's where it's intimacy like, lies is in the, yes. our vulnerability. When we're vulnerability with, with, when we're vulnerable with someone, that's where intimacy grows. That's yeah. where intimacy happens the best stuff. That, that's it. But it's, but you also have to be brave because when you open yourself up, you could get you, hurt. You can get hurt. That's what people are afraid of because a lot of people have been hurt and then they don't want to, to expose themselves mm-hmm. again. You know, whether that's a broken heart or a broken family, you know, whatever that is. I think that's the stumbling block to so many people that haven't said yes to Jesus yet. Cause I think that there's, um, there's, there's this, there's a f- fear of like worthiness. Does that make sense? Like mm-hmm. even my friends as they're going, like, I don't want to go to confession. I feel like a hypocrite. What's yeah. it, what's it, what does it matter if I'm going to sin again? And I'm like, God knew that he, he made you, he knows every hair on your head. It's just. Why take a shower then? Right, yeah, Padre Pio. Like, I, uh, did you take a shower once every? Other? I, I mean, I, I was at confession today to prepare for this podcast. Oh, that's awesome! <laughs> yeah, it's my oh, favorite sacrament. Was I had a buddy? God bless him. It was like his first. I took him. He hadn't been in confession in over thirty years. Wow! Wow! And we went like two months ago, like getting ready for like I finally like I kind of like conned him into it, <laughs> and, and and the um. He didn't have the best experience, right? But he got the absolution. I'm like, bro, you're good. You can go right. get it by a truck now. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> it's like next time you're gonna have to really prepare yourself. So my buddy had like I went to the bookstore, got him some books on it and whatever. And just like I said, because God works in mysterious ways, and I I'm, I am not a saint. I go to confession at least, at least once a week. Um, and it's not because I'm scrupulous, it's because I'm a, a moron. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, it's just the truth. That's all sin is. It's a stupid decision. Mm-hmm. Why do I do this thing I know I hate to do? I do it anyway. Yeah, well, let's go. Yeah. If he can do what I can, right? Talk about vulnerable. That guy, he, right. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so I was at some other church and because like there's a great app. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's called like Catholic Mass Times. Yep. I know that. <laughs> I know that app. And you could type in mass confession, whatever. I'm like, oh, I got to get the confession. I went yeah. to this church and they had a great like how-to guide. Mm-hmm. on confession and i gave it to my buddy today and he went in there and the joy the palpable joy he had it looked like he hit a walk-off home run to win the world series he came out of yeah. confession fist, like looks like we made it yes so so it's liberating so, Mm-hmm. It's like a weight's lifted. I always feel lighter after confession, for sure. I can't imagine 30 years. Wow. It, it, it's probably an incredible feeling. 
Well, and the devil fights, he, he fights people to want to go to confession yeah. because everyone's one confession away from being a saint. And, mm-hmm. and, and I heard a good story and I was thinking about it. It's like the, the two priests that were attacked the most were the two best confessors, Padre Pio and St. John Vianney, because they were the best confessors and they would just hear mm-hmm. confessions all the time and they would be attacked by Satan in the middle of the night. Like John Vianney would wake up and they'd be shaking his bed and the people were like, what is going on? Is because that's, they knew that there was someone coming to him that they were going to get absolution and that they were going to do something. So he didn't want that person mm-hmm. to be freed of, yeah. of that. And it's just, it's that serious, you know? And when you know what re- reconciliation, the word comes from I, eyelash to eyelash, that's where the word reconciliation means. It's like eyelash to eyelash with God, that you're literally there. I had a, as a convert, I had a crazy, I've had two crazy confession experiences. One where literally the priest like transfigured in front of me, like, like an angel. Like he, he looked, to me, I thought it was like St. Stephen. Like, right. That's what it looked like to me. It's like, and then he like disappeared. I didn't know where it was like this men's conference. Didn't see him again. It was like the craziest conversion of a, you know, like where my life changed after that. You know, I've had a couple of those and it's like, because that's how powerful that sacrament is. And, and it's like, if we can get over that being vulnerable, mm-hmm. you know, obviously he can't tell anybody. So that's the good part. I mean, some guy in Hong Kong, a priest in Hong Kong, they're trying to give him 15 years because he didn't want to break the seal of confession. Mm-hmm. Like that's how serious it is, you know, because People are worried about that, but it's just like, not only do you get absolved, but the grace that comes from that to help you live those promises, but we're going to, we're idiots. Like you said, I know I'm an idiot and you know, but it's, that's God's plan is like, Hey, you're an idiot. This is a chance back. Try again. He's the God of second chances. Absolutely. Amen. I love that. And I think you tapped on something that usually whenever I share my faith or whatever. And people are like, well, you have anything you want to share with our audience? Like, you know, like, <laughs> like, you should be part of school with you guys, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I love your podcast because it's just real and authentic and it's conversation. And it's like, you, you, you got it. Like, like there's churchy stuff. And then there's like, it's real. And like, yeah. whenever I, 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 sh- I want people to know that God is real. Our faith is real. Mm-hmm. It's tangible. It's real. I've experienced miracles. Yeah. Like God will, you will see miracles. I forget. It might have been a Saint Augustine. It was one of the geniuses of the church, and he said that faith is. And I'm paraphrasing, and I'm probably getting it wrong. And I'm sure there's probably like eight nerds that are like, "Ugh, they'll send me an email." But I think it was faith is believing in the unseen, and if you practice. Faith long enough, you'll soon see, see, see things yeah, that Augustine. you don't believe. Yeah, that's mm. Augustine. Yeah, you're right. It's the truth. Like I've seen miracles. Yeah, and that's but, my conversion story. I went to one mass. Katie invited. I'm, I, I and I was up, like a cradle Catholic. I was didn't baptized, and that serious. was the extent of my religion. And I, she invited me to midnight mass, and I never felt the what you're talking about the peace. I felt that. I'm like, what is this? I felt this over sense of love. I'm like, I, we walked out of there. I'm like, I want to go every Sunday. Like my, I walked out of that church, a different person like that. It changed. And, and through been, his conversion, it made me take my faith seriously. Cause I was brought up with what we talked about earlier that watered down, just be nice, be a good person. Right. Yeah. There's so much more to it than that. Mm-hmm. So it's a journey for sure. And God's hand is in it. And God's hand was truly in your life, Steve. What a, what an amazing yeah. testimony. And yeah, the joy just permeates out of you. And that's so great that you're able to just accompany people, meet them where they're at and accompany them. And, and you have results like a friend who hasn't been to confession in 30 years, right? I mean, that's so beautiful. And what a great witness and, and testimony. And I love that your your taking a risk, but not this, like, you're, you're able to see the big picture in the terms of your comedy. You want families to sit down and laugh with each other. You want little kids that are sick to be laughing. Like that's like, that's like true. Wow. That's such a true purpose, you know, than to just say you are, you know, going to make this like have your comedy ears. Right. And I just want to make people laugh. Well, you have, there's so much more to it. And yeah, that broadcasting of joy. There was, uh, cause right now comedy is like, I sort of, um, when I left LA, I, I was really starting to feel like Noah hammer and nails. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, and I remember it was at the 19 year mark of Los Angeles. So it was the spring of 2019. I was praying like a oh, Lord, I'm done. Like, mm-hmm. look, whatever 
was going to happen hasn't happened. Yeah. Just, I just, I'm done. I don't want to be here anymore. Right. Because it's um, not a very easy city to live. No. Can't and imagine. Then he got me out during the pandemic. Literally heard the voice of God during an earthquake. And, um, and I, I, whatever, I, I knew where I got out and then I was blessed. I never thought I'd own like in LA, you have to be a gazillionaire just to buy a little house. I yeah. came to Florida. I'm like, Oh, I guess I don't have to make it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine here. Right. I'm actually in shape and good looking too. I love <laughs> <laughs> So, um, and I sort of like, I've just been waiting for the Lord to lead me, you know, like I told God, like when I got to Florida, I was like, I don't care if you want me to scoop ice cream at Walmart. Mm. Mm-hmm. What I, yeah. Um, and he's been calling me like really calling me back to com- like, not that I ever left comedy, but to be more focused on it and mm-hmm. about beginning a Lent, a bunch of Catholic nerds. We got together and we uh, were smoking cigars, and there's there's uh, my buddy Dr. Joe was a professor at a local college, and there were some students there. And I didn't realize like comedy right now is like among young people. They're like, do you know Joe Rogan? I'm like, yeah, he's my buddy. They're like, what? So then they started to ask me if I knew all these comedians. I'm like, yeah, I know a lot of these guys. They're like, we have to check out your comedy, and I was like, oh, uh, wait. I go, you're probably not gonna like it. And they're like, what do you mean? I go, I'm not cool. <laughs> I go, well, your grandparents, I go, I, I almost guarantee you, your grandparents will love me. <laughs> it's like back to the future line. Yeah. yeah. yeah right. But I go, I, I go, the truth is, I go, I'm trying to get to heaven and not become a great comedian. I go, this is just mm. some, it, it's, that's not where my identity lies. Mm-hmm. And um, they looked at each other and their jaws dropped. They're like, what did you say? I go, I'm just trying to get into heaven. That's my main goal, not yeah. comedy. And they were like, oh, we can't wait to check out your comedy. Oh, that's great. See, they're seeking genuine. Right. They're seeking genuine truth. truth Again, where we don't have to shock value or one up or get so vulgar. It's almost uncomfortable, like not funny, but uncomfortable. Like it's just real. It makes you think more too. Are you using those, you know, cheap, those are like cheap, those are like cheap laughs, but to use the English language in a way that's funny. Yeah. Some of my closest friends are the most buck wild comedians in the world. And in their defense, it's very interesting to me because sometimes people who appear to be furthest away from God know him in a way that I haven't even encountered yet. Mm-hmm. Like their hearts are so charitable. Yeah with love and mercy. And I have noticed that some of these guys that are savages on stage. <laughs> They don't judge anybody. Yeah. And I think sometimes, oh, like this is one of my favorite memories of the comedy store. Favorite, like I was there for 20 years, got to see Robin Williams. Oh, Robin. Well, that's awesome. Everybody, all of my heroes, I've got, I got to see my friends go from starving to household names. I mean, what a beautiful, beautiful experience. And there's a very, uh, like, I would say probably 95% of the people that are tuning into this podcast, if they look up this comedian, they wouldn't be pleased with what they saw. <laughs> very, uh, the word I'll use is edgy. Okay. Mm-hmm. Very edgy, but I know him personally and he's got a heart of gold. Mm-hmm. Now, this is why I think the Lord doesn't want us to judge people, especially when it comes to their hearts. We can correct actions, whatever. I'm not so great at that. I'm not a confrontation guy. Like I said, I like to wash feet and leave it up to the Holy spirit, yep. whatever. If I have to, I, I have a moral obligation to the Lord to share what I, in that moment with his grace. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but I definitely believe I in no way understand God, uh, like his ways. He truly works in mysterious ways. And one of my favorite memories of all time to the power of stand up comedy, I was working the door. I wasn't allowed to perform at the club yet. Right. And there was a couple that came to the, to the comedy club and the gentleman was in a wheelchair, completely paralyzed from the neck down. Mm. Okay. And it, it, like immediately I was like, Oh Lord, I hope this guy has, I hope he laughs, you know, Lord. Yeah. Like, and the whole night I'm watching this couple and she, he's not laughing. Mm-hmm. And then they bring my friend Brian on stage 
and they put him on last because he will clear a room because some of the things he says are not, he definitely is not family friendly (laughs) or appropriate. And there was maybe 11 people left in the room. And as this guy's saying vicious things on stage, I just hear this. Oh, 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 oh. And it was the guy in the wheelchair and his wife literally had to wipe tears. (laughs) That's God. Yeah. You know, so he works in mysterious ways. So I don't ever want to think that I'm better than somebody. I think God, we all play a position on Team Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. I think that that role of you, he's, you know, humbling you to, you know, to put in the work at the door to to, to get your spot to get there. It's like Uh, being a comedian. My story. Yeah. Like, Wait, I'm like, I don't know. Rudy would have quit. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. I mean, you got to take a lot of uh, lumps and a lot of, mm-hmm. you know, it, a lot of people can't handle the rejection and the, the, the you know, the. it's tough. Ah, that's so brave. I mean, to go up in front of people and, you know. Bear your soul. Really. Yeah. I mean, that's what you're doing. You're being vulnerable right. on, on stage. I mean, it's just you. Yeah. You got no one's, you know, God can bail you out, but no one else is going to come up there and say your jokes for you or be funny. Mm-hmm. No, but I will say this. And like, if I ever get a chance to like do more churches or maybe I I don't even know, maybe I would even say this in a secular, because I think as society, like we're getting to the point where the world is so lost. I'm Mm -hmm. trying not to be negative. Things are bad guys. Right. Right. Um, So who knows what God has in store for me, but I had said this once with my Christian buddies and I said, I moved to Hollywood to become rich and famous and that didn't happen. But I did get a personal relationship with Jesus Christ Mm -hmm. and for that it was worth it. And what the Lord did was like my journey, like, yeah, it was humbling. Mm -hmm. And it got to the point where like, I didn't have any other option than Jesus. Yeah. he, 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 some people don't have that blessing. Their life is so good. Yeah. Or it's so easy that they might even trick themselves that it's them that's earning all of those things. And man, it was, when I say it got dark, it got dark. Mm-hmm. And Jesus was, the, I was like, this is it, man. I, it's Jesus or nothing. This is all I had. That's that, that beatitude, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit. It's not about poverty per se with money. It's, it's, Blessed are those that hit rock bottom because all they have is God to cling to. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a blessing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's that's the only way I found God is that I, I lost everything. I lost my job, my house, my hair. I lost everything. And and mm. and it's like you have to empty yourself if you want him to fill you. Yeah. You know, and you have to be humble to to say, Hey, I made all these errors, I made these problems right. myself. How am I gonna fix them if I put myself here? The first lesson, like so my faith was evolving and I was getting closer to the Lord. And then when COVID hit, it kicked into overdrive. Mm-hmm. Right. And I remember the first lesson the Holy Spirit gave me during the early days of COVID. The word that just kept on coming to me was humility. Humility. Mm-hmm. And then I believe it was God. It wasn't that I heard it with my ears, but in my heart, the Holy Spirit was like, you see, humility is the path. It's kind of like a, it's the transportation system my grace can travel through Mm -hmm. that if you have a little bit of humility, it's like a little dirt road through the woods, but he was like, the more humble you become, it can be a 10 lane freeway and you're just going to have grace. Prayers go up, grace comes down, but it's the only way that works is with humility, which is just recognizing the truth, right? He's God. Mm -hmm. Who am I? Mm -hmm. And, And I think that's, there's so much to that. Like, he's God. Like, we can't comprehend his love, his mercy, his genius. But humility is everything. It is. Everything. That's where your journey has to start. I just just, just always remember, uh, you said Teresa of Avila earlier, you said, he's God, I'm not. You know, that's, that's, Mm -hmm. that's it. And too much of what it, what we fall in that temptation is trying to control what's going on in the situation. Humility is letting it go and having that, you know, it's a, it's a, trust and it's but you know it's hard to you can't trust somebody you don't have a relationship with it's like that's why a lot of people don't want to turn to god because either they had bad 
relationships with church people, not necessarily yeah. God, but other people. Or their know, own ch- fathers or, you yeah. know, other, other yeah. things that it makes it a, a difficult yeah. way to, but again, just by living, living our faith as disciples, being a witness in our joy and loving them, meeting them where, where they're at. That's it. Yeah. That's it. And that's humility too. Not having that judgment, you know, yeah. Or you know, C.S. Lewis says, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking le- uh, less about yourself and help- thinking about oh. other people and getting out, helping. Thinking I, of yourself th- less. Thinking of yourself less. I messed that up. Yeah, yeah you did totally yes. mess that up. Yeah, he's the best. Him, and G.K. Chesterton's my, my, yeah. my go-to. G.K. Chesterton, I have to read four times before I understand what he's saying. And then yeah, I get it. Too. Then I totally get yeah. it. Lewis, man, I remember reading Mirror Christianity and I was like, whoa. Mm-hmm. And then through tape letters. Yeah. Oh man, you, I, my dream project is screw tape letters in reverse, and I'm writing it. Oh, <laughs> comedy TV show. Oh my and gosh, it, it's about God's most experienced angel teaching a young angel how it's really done. Oh, cool! That's cool. I love that. That's a great yeah. idea. We went to the screw tape letter play in Chicago the one it wasn't time. That good. Yeah, it was. Let's not talk about it. Yeah, it was. It, it wasn't very well done. Yeah, I think. It, her mom dragged us to it. Well, no, I, we thought it would be cool. But yeah, it was. Isn't that, I think there's such a demand for cool stuff that also glorifies God. Mm-hmm. That's right? done well. Like, oh man, like I can't wait. I'm going to take my, tomorrow's St. Joseph's Day. I'm going to take my parents to mass. And then we're going to go see the Cabrini film. Yes, yeah, I heard I it's so good. We're yeah. so trying to get, a, she's so, she's a principal at a Catholic school. So mm-hmm. it's like. This is her busy time. Yeah, yeah. she's wow. she's this is my hit the ground. Oh, please, please, and thank you. Yeah, so it's as much our, as you our can. schedules are like. Uh, yeah, but I really want to see that movie. I've, anyone who's seen it has said it's really good, and I think it's great that more quality films that aren't lame and you know are are being made right now centered around faiths and people of faith. I think that's. It's so, so yeah. great. <laughs> we well, need, we, need you know, good we, media. we have to support. You know, if we want to see more of those kind of projects we have to go support them you know it's like yeah. support you know, the arts and support to, the know, artists that are making trying, it we're, we're gonna go spend our money hope maybe this weekend right. we're gonna get but we want to bring the kids our kids are 10 yeah. and 7 but like we want to see you know bring them there and, yep. and support but like you know it, you know if you see an artist that's catholics you know i shared something today it's like support those people you want to see good art good comedians good movies that are you know then put your money where your uh, you i know, like that though too that whole it. idea of the supporting Catholic artists, but also artists who are Catholic. Yeah. I like that. It doesn't too. have to I be like overt and, and cheesy. Right. Yeah. That's the way they, right. they've you know, done it for too long. You did a great job with that. Being a Chicago guy, you have to be familiar with John Hughes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, for sure. Oh yeah. You know, my son's favorite movie is home alone and there's that church scene in it. And it's like, Correct. when you watch some of those movies from the eighties, there's, there is a, a stream of morality still within them yeah. that we don't see in new movies now. So, I mean, I introduce um, all my, you know, all, I, I introduce our kids to those old movies that I grew up in because I feel like there is still a sense of right and wrong, right? And Absolutely. that whole church conversation in Home Alone is so good. Like, you're always welcome at church. Yeah. And that was on purpose. Yeah. Like, that's how he would put his faith in there and. The, the late, great John Candy was, I mean, he had a priest with him on the set of the movie when he passed. Like, oh, wow. you, could see, you could see Chris Christ, Farley, too. Chris Farley, yeah, was in Matt Farley? Foley. It was like his real... Chris, yeah, he was a priest. He was a priest. Yeah, he became but, a buddy from Marquette who became a mm-hmm. priest, right? Chris uh-huh. Farley was a, a Catholic. He was a very generous person, I heard, you know, in that uh, sense. Yeah, I'm friends with Chris's brother, Kevin, who's also... I used oh, to see him cool. He's awesome. Oh, cool. We watched a documentary that I sobbed like a, like ugly cried when we watched that documentary that had his brother in it. And he talks about his, his, his brother and, oh man, that was a tough, that was a tough, that was one of the hardest documentaries I ever watched. They said I ugly cried in it. So my my parents know where they were when president Kennedy was assassinated. I remember where I was when I found out about Chris Farley. Mm -hmm. So that was like a hero to you. Oh, huge. Yeah. Hero. Yeah. And that's why I love Adam Sandler. Like whenever I want to like have a, you know, like driving along by myself, hanging out with God. And sometimes I just want to feel it. I want to feel something. <laughs> and I play Adam Sandler's Farley. Have you heard that song? No. I thought you were going to uh, say Lunch Lady Heaven or is that called Lunch Lady Heaven? What is that called? Lunch Lady Heaven. Yeah. Tribute to Chris Farley. Oh, and he mentions about 
Farley always waking up and going to mass. Oh, really? I didn't yeah, know that. I, oh, yeah. When I first moved to L.A., the first parish I belonged to was St. Monica's. And they would, everybody had Chris Farley stories. Wow. wow. About like, you know, he would cook chili at the big Oktoberfest and there would be 300 little kids around his booth and he would make everybody laugh. Or <laughs> they had stories about him, you know, picking up a homeless guy off the street and bringing him to a meeting with him and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was a special soul. Yeah. Wow. Funny story ever. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. And, and it's so many people that are, you know, that are hurting though, that, you know, that we, we, we're too busy sometimes to stop and see like, yeah, someone may be laughing, but like, are, are we checking on people? Are we getting to know, like mm-hmm. there's so many people that are either close to us or coworkers, like the statistics are not good. The despair for people, internal you hit on these internal battles and these demons and the culture's answer is gambling on sports on your phone, porn on your phone. Uh, you no, name it. Do what feels good. Yeah, That's and, the answer in our culture. Or, yeah. Chasing. If it feels good, do it. And yeah, well, do what makes you happy. Misery. Yeah, that's right? it. Right. You know, and it's it's. So there's it's there's another way, and I think that living that other way with joy is is the answer. So and being authentic, like mm-hmm. like that's your style. It's like, but that's what people gravitate. You know, we were watching this thing yesterday. This guy Gary Brecka, and he was just talking about like the science is in on being authentic. It like it creates like a, a frequency that they're doing mm-hmm. a study from Harvard that like when you're authentic and you believe it, there's vibrations there's that there's like come vibrations off of your body. vibrations that come off of your body, not like the law. He was trying to do the law of attraction stuff, but we know that's God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's so great that you mentioned it. Like, because I watch some stuff and then I'm like, all right, all right. Oh, you, lost, yeah. you lost me in the laws of attraction, manifesting. Yeah. The kids right. want to do that kind of stuff, but the, you know, yeah, you be careful what there's you're trying to is going to be a truth to some of these things, but remember what the devil does. He takes the truth and he twe- tweaks it a little bit. I mean, yeah. and so, but there's still nuggets there and we can pull that out. It's just, it's just to discern what is the truth and what isn't, you know, yeah. but, it, yeah. but it's especially people, you know, who are, you can tell someone who's authentic because the people want to be around those people. People, right. don't, people don't, they can tell if you're a fake person mm-hmm. or if you're, you know, right. you're phony. Yeah. Well, Steve, yeah. this was great. We're so I'm so excited that we got to know you this way, and and I can't wait to sit on the couch with my family and watch more some more of your comedy for sure. Yeah, I'll send as soon as we get through editing and the animation and stuff. I'll send you guys a sneak peek because oh, awesome. like the one show we filmed was truly all ages. So there was from ages two years old up until well into their 80s. Oh, cool. And it was great to make an audience like that laugh all with the same stuff. Yes, that's so awesome. Definitely, definitely, definitely family friendly. So awesome. what else do you have uh, in the pipeline that we can let people know to, you know, we'll share your Instagram yeah, how and stuff like that. people find you? What do you want us to know? Yeah. What do you want us to um, put out there? Just, um, the special will be out shortly. My Instagram is just Steve Simone Comedy. Uh, I do have some dates coming up where I'm in San Diego at the comedy store. I'm at a comedy club in Winnipeg, I think. But, uh, this week I'm headed back to the comedy store. Then I go to the mothership in Austin, which is the best club in the country. That's cool. Oh, my, my brother's going in uh, April to play poker. He was trying mm-hmm. to get me to go. But that was the only reason I wanted to go. I wanted to go to. <laughs> you wanted to go to the there's comedy. A, there's some. The there's trip. some like poker lodge. I play poker, uh, not much anymore. But my brother plays like serious poker, and he's That's he's cool. like I, he got an invite to this lodge. It's like a live stream, like YouTube, like it's a, like pros like Doug Polk and these guys, they have like a pro game. It's like called the lodge. It's live streamed. It's like huge games. So my brother got a seat in April, Whoa. and I'm mm-hmm. like, you know. If, like I if I go, go, I just, can we I, go I just to want to go to the mothership. mothership? That's, the only, that's the only reason I want <laughs> yeah. to go. Well, let me know because God willing, I'm going to try to – have all my friends are there. Like what jo- – Joe created uh, Comedian's Paradise in Austin. He took the best of the comedy store and then threw a lot of money behind it and made it mm-hmm. even better. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so much of the staff – like the comedy store is just like this – it's a f- extended family that I'm part of. Like, And it's, I just want to go there to see familiar faces – I'd be humbled to perform on that stage. Very cool. But uh, God willing, I'll be getting out there about once a month. So we'll plan a trip. Oh, that sounds that's great. Awesome. That's so I know cool. hearing, the, hearing him talk about it and all the people about the comedy store. It's so like it's like you just want to go there. It's like, but you know, the, everyone has that reverence, you know, for the comedy store, and the, I'm glad that they're keeping it alive because of you know necessity. God's had to plan, you know, COVID 
you know, created a lot of opportunity. We started this podcast during COVID. It's like, mm-hmm. you're like a lot of people saw COVID as something bad. Like we saw it no, as an opportunity. I think that in all bad things, God finds a way to have a greater good that comes out of it. And that's Amen. what we're seeing the fruit of that. Amen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A priest body mind said, God can draw, draw, God uses crooked lines to draw straight. Exactly. He yep. He sure does. So we'll, we'll, we'll share all your stuff. It's, you know, you make me laugh. This was an awesome, uh, I'm glad that you made some time for us and yeah. we just like having Always. conversations with, mm-hmm. with, with, with people and, yeah. and like the, let the Holy Spirit guide us. So we really appreciate your time sure. and, um, we'll just end with, uh, just a, a glory be in the name of the father, son, Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, Father and, and to the Son, Son and, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as it was, was in the beginning, beginning is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 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 Amen.